Welcome back everyone, ready to dive deep again. Today we're all about neural networks, those powerful but sometimes finicky beasts. Finicky is a good word for it. Right, and we're going to figure out how to train them effectively, especially when it comes to those tricky gradients. Ah yes, vanishing and exploding gradients. It's like trying to tame a wild stallion. That's a great analogy. We're lucky to have excerpts from Daniel Voigt Godoy's Deep Learning with PyTorch step-by-step -step to guide us. It's a fantastic resource full of practical insights. Absolutely. Okay, so Godoy jumps right into the vanishing gradients problem. Have you encountered this much in your work? Oh, plenty of times. It's one of those things that can really sneak up on you. Basically, in a really deep network, and when I say deep, I mean lots of layers, those signals that help the model learn, they can get weaker, like way weaker. It's like a game of telephone. Exactly. The message gets more and more garbled as it's passed along. And in a deep network, that means the model struggles to learn effectively. It just can't make sense of those faint whispers. Right. And Godoy gives us a really helpful way to visualize this with what he calls a block model. I like this analogy. It's easy to grasp. So each layer of neurons is like a building block, and they're all trying to learn from a data set of points. And he uses the example of them being within a sphere. And... This is where that tricky concept of internal covariate shift comes into play. Okay, I'm going to need some help with this one. Basically, it's like each layer is speaking a slightly different dialect of the same language. So they're all speaking activation, but with different accents. You got it. And that makes it hard for the model to connect the dots, to see the relationship between the input and the final output. It's like trying to assemble a puzzle where the pieces don't quite fit together. No wonder those signals start to vanish. They're getting lost in translation. Precisely. And the deeper the network, the more layers, the worse this problem becomes. We see this in figure E point, where Godoy shows how the activation values those signals. They just shrink with each passing layer. And when those signals become too weak, learning grinds to a halt. The model just can't figure out what it's supposed to be learning. So what can we do? How do we amplify those whispers, make sure those signals stay strong? Godoy talks about initialization schemes are these the key? They're definitely a good place to start. Think of it like giving your model a good set of starting blocks. Okay, so we're talking about tweaking those initial weights. And he specifically mentions Xavier and Kaming initialization. Right, and these schemes are all about finding the right balance. We want the initial signals to be strong enough to be heard, but not so strong that they overwhelm the system. Like finding the right volume knob setting. So how do we know which scheme to use? Well, Xavier initialization often works well with sigmoid or tan activation functions. And those are pretty common, right? They are, but real U activations are even more widely used these days. And for those, Kaming initialization is usually the way to go. It's like having a cheat sheet for which scheme to try first. Exactly. And the nice thing is that PyTorch, the deep learning library Yudoi uses, has these initialization methods built in. So we don't have to do all the math ourselves. That's a relief. Absolutely. But there's another trick up our sleeve, a more powerful tool for taming those vanishing gradients. Oh, and that is, tell me more. Batch normalization. Instead of just tweaking those initial weights, batch normalization swoops in and acts as a kind of universal translator between our layers. So it's smoothing out those different dialects we were talking about, making sure everyone's speaking the same language. You got it. So it's not just about the volume of those signals, but also about clarity. Exactly. And you can actually see this in figure E.3. Batch normalization makes the activation flow much smoother. Okay. Vanishing gradients, bad. Got it. But Godoy doesn't stop there. He throws us another curveball exploding gradients. Now things are getting really wild. Instead of whispers dying out, it's like those signals are getting amplified way too loud. Yeah, it's like someone cranked the volume up way too high and everything's distorted. And that can really mess things up during training. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Our model can become unstable and learning goes haywire. Godoy gives us a big red flag to watch out for. NAN values. NAN, like not a number. What does that even mean in this context? It basically means those gradients have spun out of control. They've become too large for the computer to even represent as numbers. So if we see NAN, it's time to hit the panic button. Not necessarily panic, but definitely time to take action. Okay, so what can we do to get those exploding gradients under control? Well, Godoy walks us through several approaches. One option is to standardize our target variable, make those values more consistent. So if our target values have a huge range, like from zero to a million, we might want to scale them down. Exactly. It's like smoothing out a bumpy road makes for a less jerky ride. 
Another option is to lower the learning rate. Oh, right, the learning rate that controls how big of a step the model takes with each update. Right, smaller steps, less chance of overshooting, and ending up with those crazy gradients. But the technique Godoy seems most keen on, and for good reason, is gradient clipping. Gradient clipping, I like the sound of that. It's intuitive. So we're literally just setting limits on how big those gradients can get. You've got it. It's like saying, hey, gradients, you can do your thing, but you've got a speed limit. I like it. So tell me more about this gradient clipping. How does it actually work? Godoy breaks it down into two main approaches, mm -hmm. value clipping and norm clipping. Okay, so value clipping first, what's the idea there? It's pretty straightforward, actually. With value clipping, we set a hard limit for each individual gradient. So let's say we set a clip value of 1.0. If a gradient comes in at 2.5, boom, it gets chopped down to 1.0. No more runaway gradients. And I see Godoy even gives us a handy PyTorch function for this, nn.utils.clipgradValue. Exactly. It's super easy to implement. However, as with anything, there's a potential trade-off. There's always a trade-off. What is it with value clipping? <laughs> well, value clipping can sometimes make our gradient descent, the way our model learns, a little less efficient. Less efficient? How so? It's like this. Imagine you're trying to find the lowest point in a valley, but you can only take steps of a certain size. If you hit that maximum step size too often, you might end up zigzagging your way down instead of taking a more direct route. Okay. That makes sense. So we're controlling those gradients, but we might be sacrificing a bit of speed in the process. Exactly. And that's where norm clipping comes in. Okay, norm clipping. This sounds a bit more sophisticated. Instead of setting a hard limit for each individual gradient, norm clipping sets a limit for their combined magnitude, their norm. So it's like a budget for the whole team of gradients. You got it. You've got a total of 1.0 to work with. Distribute it amongst yourselves as you see fit. So individual gradients might still be big, but their total impact is kept in check. And of course, Godoy gives us another PyTorch function for this one, nn.utils.clipgradNorm. He wouldn't leave us hanging. And the beauty of norm clipping is that it tends to preserve the overall direction of our gradient descent. We're controlling the speed, not the direction, so we're less likely to get those weird zigzags. So value clipping for a hard limit, norm clipping for a more team-oriented approach. But wait, there's more, right? Godoy introduces these things called backward hooks. What are those all about? Backward hooks are really interesting, especially when we're dealing with those time-dependent models or current neural networks or RNNs. They're like setting up checkpoints throughout our network as the gradients are being calculated. We can peek at them in real time and make adjustments on the fly. It's like having a vigilant chaperone at a school dance, making sure things don't get too out of hand. I like that analogy. And Godoy even provides the code for implementing these backward hooks. So you're ready to wrangle those gradients in real time. So he's given us all these tools, initialization schemes, batch normalization, gradient clipping. Does he have a favorite? He's definitely shown us that both value clipping and norm clipping are effective in many situations. But when it comes to those RNNs, those backward hooks are really where it's at. He illustrates this beautifully with figure E.9. We see a much smoother distribution of gradients when we use those backward hooks, right? It's like comparing a free-flowing river to a series of controlled locks. Both manage the flow of water, but those locks give us that extra level of precision, especially when we're dealing with a trickier terrain. This has been such an insightful deep dive into gradient clipping. I feel like we've gone from feeling lost in the weeds to having a real map and compass for navigating the world of deep learning. I agree. And what I appreciate about Godoy's approach is that he doesn't just throw these techniques at you and say, good luck. He explains the why, the how, the potential pitfalls. It's like having a seasoned guide there with you every step of the way. Absolutely. So as we wrap up here, what are some of your biggest takeaways? What really stuck with you from this deep dive? You know, it's so easy to get caught up in the excitement of building these complex models that we forget about those little things that can trip us up during training. Those silent saboteurs, those vanishing and exploding gradients. Exactly. But as Godoy shows us, they don't have to derail our efforts. There are ways to spot those warning signs early on. Like those NAN values we talked about. Exactly. Those are a sure sign something's amiss. Or if you see your model learning way too slowly, that's another red flag. It's like our model is trying to tell us something's wrong. We just need to know how to listen. Yes. And what's encouraging is that the solutions aren't about brute force, you know, forcing our models to behave. It's more about understanding those underlying dynamics, those subtle forces at play. And then applying just the right amount of control. Exactly. 
whether it's using the right initialization scheme, bringing in batch normalization, or getting those gradients under control with clipping or backward hooks. It's all about working with our models, not against them. I like that. It's a much more collaborative approach to deep learning. Definitely. So as we wrap up, here's a final thought for our listeners to ponder. Godoy mentions that finding those optimal clipping values often takes some fine tuning. Do you think there might be a more systematic way to determine those ideal values? Could we develop some guidelines based on the specific model architecture or the data set we're using? That's a fantastic question and a great place to start exploring as you dive deeper into the world of deep learning. So to all our listeners out there, if you're ready to tame those wild gradients and take your deep learning skills to the next level, be sure to check out Daniel Voigt Godoy's Deep Learning with PyTorch Step-by-Step. Step. It's an incredible resource that we highly recommend. And until next time, happy learning.